Well, thank you uh, so very much, uh, Professor. It's an honor to be here. You know, for Americans, being able to speak about science in a, in a place like this is something very unusual. It's, uh, we're so new, so this is a, a real uh, honor for, for an American scientist to be in such amazing uh, uh, circumstances here, and I deeply appreciate the honor of uh, being part of the, this extraordinary academy that I've mi admired for years. What I'd like to do this morning is, since we don't have a lot of time, is kind of give a, what I call a 30,000 foot aerial view of the neglected tropical diseases to introduce the problem. And it's a problem that is not only a problem in science, but also uh, uh, that involves politics, economics, uh, many other human disciplines. And this is what makes neglected tropical diseases uh, so very interesting. And the concept really came out of what we call the Millennium Development Goals. So back in 2000, now 18 years ago, the world leaders came to the United Nations headquarters in New York and agreed upon these eight goals for sustainable development for, in order to help a group that was then called the bottom billion, the billion people in the world who lived on no money to be able to uh, lift themselves out of poverty. And, and one of the really game-changing aspects of these Millennium Development Goals was that there were three devoted to health, number four, number five, and number six, to reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, and this number six. The idea being, and that what was so different about it at this time, now it seems obvious to us, but back then, the concept was health uh, a disease not only occurs in the setting of poverty, but causes poverty. And there's one that was specifically uh, associated with infectious diseases, number six, to combat AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And this is what, of course, launched the Global Fund to fight AIDS, they added tuberculosis and malaria. That's what launched in the U.S. side the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief. So particularly for AIDS and malaria, it had enormous consequences. The problem, there was a problem though with this Millennium Development Goal, and that's this one here. Somebody came up with the idea of something called other diseases, and that was a, that was a problem, because you never saw Bono, Tony Blair, and Bill Gates standing up saying, now we're going to take on other diseases. And so those of us who worked on the other diseases, like Pierre, Professor Parlier, and myself, felt we were on the outside looking in at all this exciting momentum that was building Globally. So it was with that in mind, in terms of the origin of this term, neglected tropical diseases, it was really in response to it being called other diseases. And uh, a group of us, including myself and David Molyneux and Liverpool and Alan Fennick and Imperial College London, got together really and did what was kind of a marketing exercise <laughs> where we took these 13 or 14 tropical infections, uh, and I'll show you the list in, in a moment. Uh, that were highly prevalent among the poor, uh, chronic and debilitating diseases and both occurred in the setting of poverty and caused poverty and, and branded them as neglected tropical uh, diseases. And we started writing uh, papers about this concept, even writing a book about it. Uh, this is a book that we wrote called Forgotten People, Forgotten uh, Diseases. And, and, and here's an example of, of course, of a neglected tropical diseases, lymphatic filariasis. This is an individual, this is a disease of, at that time, 100 million people, and he's too sick to help support his family. So this is an example of how this both occurs in the setting of poverty and causes poverty. And he says, it's quite a problem for me when I have to stand to work for long periods of time. One of the issues about neglected tropical diseases is many of them were not killer diseases, they were debilitating rather than killer diseases. And that was a difficult concept to get people uh, to care about. Here's another example of one uh, which is so incredibly important but we don't hear a lot about, female genital schistosomiasis uh, affecting 100 million girls and women on the African continent, arguably Africa's most common gynecologic problem. And now it's been linked to a three to four fold increase in HIV AIDS transmission. So again, a very important disease, but one which nobody had ever heard about. Now, the, what the World Health Organization has done is they've expanded that list uh, from our original one from 13 to 14 to now 20 conditions, and I've had malaria here just for comparison. But the point is, uh, just to be impressed with the numbers, 799,450,000 people with hookworm, whipworm, schistosomiasis, scabies, 
Shabbos and things that we'll hear more about today. The point is, every single person who is poor, every single person who lives in extreme poverty, has at least one of these neglected tropical diseases. So our first attempt to do something about them was to uh, propose this concept of a package of medicines. Because the medicines were being donated by the major pharmaceutical companies, we could put them together in a package that we call the Rapid Impact Package. And we showed that this package of medicine, which included uh, albendazole or mebendazole for intestinal worm infections, praziquantel for schistosomiasis, ivermectin for filarial infections, for apocerchiasis, and lymphatic filariasis, and zithromax for trachoma, could be given for less than 50 cents a person per year, actually 40 cents a person, US cents per year, practically almost no money compared to the cost of antiretroviral drugs or antimalarial drugs. And we proposed this concept and wrote about it in back-to-back -back papers in the Public Library of Science in 2005. The problem was we had no advocates, right, because all of the advocacy was being, was very focused on HIV AIDS and malaria, and it was very hard to get somebody to care about other diseases. So as scientists, we went about doing this ourselves. So I started working with the US Congress, and at that time, President Bush, uh, and then the Clinton Global Initiative, and we were able to get funds appropriated through the US International Agency for International Development, the, and also DFID, the British Department for International Development, to the point where we could scale up to about $100 million a year, which is not a lot of money compared to PEPFAR or other programs, but it was enough to now advance uh, this, this package of, of medicines. And the result now is, according to the World Health Organization, we've treated more than one billion people with this package. And this has been the impact in terms of reducing the disability-adjusted life years, the number of healthy life years lost from premature death or disability. <coughs> and you can see that we've now achieved, uh, this is a new paper that just came out in the public, in PLUS NTDs, uh, between uh, 25 and 44% reduction in both the prevalence and disability of these infections. So we're starting to make an impact to the point where we can even talk about eliminating some of these diseases as a public health problem, although we're not doing very well for hookworm infection. So the problem is this. We were all very excited about this, making great progress. Everybody was very congratulating us. But then we had a new problem. And I don't know if you've ever seen this arcade game called Whack-A-Mole, where you knock something down and then another thing pops up. This, this is what happened with our neglected tropical diseases. So just as we thought we were making great success and progress, we've seen these new 21st century drivers have a big impact. And, and the three new drivers are not necessarily very obvious but they become very important. So they appear to be conflict and war, and I'll talk more about that. Poverty and a shift in nature of poverty, we call blue marble health, and climate change also seems to have an uh, enormous amount of importance. So let's go to conflict first. So what we're seeing now is this dramatic rise in disease in the Middle East, uh, particularly in, uh, in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen, We've seen, of course, the return of measles and polio, but vast numbers of cases of leishmaniasis, schistosomiasis. With no international borders, animals are being trafficked. So we see zoonotic diseases, brucellosis. So this is where the next Ebola will come from. It won't be Ebola, but it's going to be something very dramatic. This is the one of the ones we're working on that are occurring in the Middle East. The locals call it Aleppo evil. It's not a killer disease, but it's highly disfiguring. It's a leishmania parasite injected by a sandfly that causes terrible disfigurement of the face, especially if you're a young woman or a girl, you're rendered unmarriageable, it's grounds for spousal abandonment, it's a, it's a terrible problem. Uh, and, and then it's not just war, it's also extreme political instability. So we're seeing this now in Venezuela, where uh, because of the collapse of the government there, we've seen the return of malaria and schistosomiasis and leishmaniasis and Chagas disease and the arbovirus infections. So at one time, malaria in Venezuela was at the, at the top of countries in Latin America combating disease. Now, now, they're, at, now they're at the bottom, again, because of war and political instability. The other uh, big driver is the shifting nature of poverty. And this is uh, uh, the book uh, that, that well, was mentioned earlier called Blue Marble Health. And the idea behind it is that um, we're seeing, we've made great progress with the Millennium Development Goals of reducing poverty and disease. But uh, we're seeing, though, this, this new problem arise 
and that it's the poor living among the wealthy or the poorest of the rich that are now accounting for most of the world's neglected tropical disease. So on a global scale, uh, the, G, the group of 20 countries, which are the 20 wealthiest economies together with Nigeria, which is a country that's larger than the bottom four or five G20 countries, now account for at least half the world's uh, helmet infections, leishmaniasis, tuberculosis, dengue, Chagas disease, and leprosy, and, and the list goes on. And this has a lot of policy implications because it says if we could get the leaders of the G20 countries together and just redefine their commitment to their own poor, we can make a huge difference. Uh, and this includes the southern United States. Many people are surprised to hear that the U.S. has that level of poverty. But there are now 19 million Americans that live in extreme poverty and one half the U.S. poverty level, and uh, at least uh, almost 2 million families living on less than $2 a day, the same level of poverty you as you use elsewhere. So we've now flipped that global health lens and looked inward on the United States, and we're finding a lot of transmission of hookworm disease uh, in Alabama. People thought it was long gone, but when you take the time to look and go into the poor, especially rural areas of the U.S., you find widespread neglected tropical diseases. Or in Texas, uh, Texas, it turns out, has great wealth, as everybody knows about, but the people don't know the, dark, the other side of Texas, where we have 5 million Texans living below poverty, especially on the border with Mexico, where we have extreme poverty. But even in the wealthy cities like Houston, these are pictures from Houston, Texas, right next to uh, incredible wealth and incredible mansions is extreme poverty. And we're finding transmission of Chagas disease and typhus, uh, parasitic worm infections uh, all, of, all over the state of Texas as well. Um, and so one of the things that we're, we're now, let's shift gears a little bit, tell you one of the things we're doing about them. Clearly there, it requires a multidimensional approach. We're very interested in developing vaccines uh, for some of these diseases. And the problem there becomes a market problem and that we make vaccines that the big pharmaceutical companies would not be interested in making. So we've set up a nonprofit uh, product development partnership with the Texas Medical Center in this building over here, uh, which is part of Texas Children's Hospital, where we're developing vaccines for a wide variety of neglected tropical diseases. So we have uh, both a hookworm and schistosomiasis vaccine, uh, now in clinical trials in Gabon, uh, and in Brazil, and the idea that we would pair them together to take on these very uh, poor parts of, of, of the world. And this vaccine is now, uh, we've gone past phase one clinical trials, and now we're moving into phase two uh, clinical development. Uh, we're also looking at uh, Chagas <coughs> disease transmission uh, in Texas, and these are some of the different maps uh, where we're actually seeing transmission of the disease. And we have a new vaccine that we're developing for Chagas disease. And the idea behind that one is uh, that uh, the, when the drug benzinibazole, which is the major drug used for it, once heart disease starts, the drug doesn't seem to uh, reduce heart disease. So we've developed this novel vaccine with a recombinant protein and an adjuvant from a Japanese company, ASI, that has actually been shown that we could block the development of fibrosis. Uh, linked to uh, heart disease and Chagas disease. So that's quite exciting, and that one will go into the clinic as well. And then we're also focusing on how we can not only, how we make, what vaccines we make, but how we make them. And I took on this role in 2015-2016 in the Obama administration after he went to Cairo in 2009 and talked about reaching out to the Muslim world and the arts and sciences, and he tapped me a science envoy to promote vaccine development across the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, we've now been taking this on and building capacity in the Middle East to uh, develop, so they can indigenously develop a leishmaniasis vaccine uh, that's now uh, moving into clinical trials. And this is a collaboration between Jesus Valenzuela's group at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And what's interesting about it is it targets both the leishmania parasite as the sand fly. So we're advancing these vaccines and getting a lot of pro progress but now we're seeing a new challenge that we totally didn't expect. And so, and it's becoming a problem with all global vaccines. So at the same time that the Millennium Development Goals were launched in 2000, when uh, the, uh, we created PEPFAR and then this NTD program, the other great program that was created, of course, was GAVI, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, to vaccinate the world's children. And the, the way I've chosen to illustrate that 
is this group of wonderful black and white images from the Brazilian photographer Salgado, who spent a year going around the world photographing children getting their oral polio vaccine. I picked this one because the boy's dog is empathizing with the, with the boy. Uh, I like that one in particular. And we've made great progress globally. And this is what's happened with measles, where we've gone from a uh, killer disease of 2 million children in 1980 through the Gavi Alliance. We've reduced it not to 68,000 deaths. So this is what's happening globally. But again, we have this new problem. And the new problem is the return of measles to Europe uh, and the United States. So this is what's happened last year across Europe. We've had 20,000 measles cases uh, in Europe. And 2018 is looking worse than 2017. Uh, the numbers are really going up to the point now for the World Cup uh, in, in Russia, there's a warning to get your uh, measles vaccine, where uh, there's now a very active anti-vaccine movement in the United States. These are the number of children not getting vaccinated in the public schools, it's 50,000. It's probably much more in the private schools as well, maybe 100,000 kids are not being vaccinated. I get involved in this because I'm a vaccine scientist, though my youngest daughter, Rachel, also has severe autism and other mental disabilities. And I spend a lot of time trying to explain to public audiences why vaccines do not cause autism. And I show papers like this, like Eric Parchesny's groups that show the changes in the brains of kids with autism happen, happen to be getting early pregnancy, well before they ever see vaccines. And of course, this is invited, this may be public enemy number one among the anti-vaccine movement, being an autism dad and saying that, autism, that vaccines do not cause autism. And I've turned this around a little bit and said, you know, this is partly our fault as scientists and that we're so fixed on talking to each other that we don't think about public engagement. And this is why I think meetings like this are so important to, to bring in the public. So my colleagues at Research America, a uh, public, uh, public group in Washington, have found that now 81% of Americans cannot name a living scientist. And the ones who could, who are they naming? You know, Stephen Hawking built this when he was still alive. Bill Nye, the science guy, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Not scientists as we know them who write grants and papers and go to lab meetings. And so we have a real problem in that most people do not understand what we do. Uh, the study also found that fewer than 10% of scientists ever blog about their science or use social media. So we need to do a better job doing public and engagement. And this is my last slide, the next to last slide I'll show you. So one of the things we're doing is I have a new book coming out. I like to write books. And uh, this one is my most personal one of all. And really to fight the anti-vaccine movement. It's called Vaccines Did Not, Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, which is a really fighting the anti-vaccine movement, what it's like to be an autism parent. And this is not, these are not easy things to do because it's a very personal account. But at the same time, you also have this very aggressive and well-organized anti-vaccine movement trying to uh, destroy my efforts to, to, to try to do this. So this will, this will it's already available. And you can pre-order on Amazon. And it'll, it'll come out soon. So I've run out of time. I'll stop there by ending by this quote from Elie Wiesel, who once said, man's weakness is not in achieving victories, <coughs> but in taking advantage of them. We've achieved victories, right? We're near elimination of measles, only to allow measles to come back to Europe and the United States. We're making great progress in neglected tropical diseases, only to see modern 21st century forces like war, conflict, uh, political instability, and shifting nature of poverty allow them to come back. So we have to figure out a way, I think, through public engagement to uh, avoid these kinds of issues. So I look forward to the discussion at the end. Thank you so much again for having me.